you gents. Today we're taking a look at the all new, just released BMW X2, which I'm very excited about. As you may know, I drive an i3 today. I've been driving BMWs for 10 years, and my lease is coming up in October, so it gives me a great opportunity to come look at some new cars, see what's out there, and this will be kind of an ongoing series. Thank you to PW BMW in Shadyside. I'll link to them below for letting me take this out for a spin and shoot some video with it. And I also want to say up front that I am not into the technical and finer details of the engine and that kind of thing. What I really want to talk about is what the car feels like to drive and to use in a daily use instead of the technical details, which there's tons of videos and magazines out there that'll cover that. And then I'll also do a comparison between the X1 and the X2, because I think the logical conclusion, if you're looking at this type of sport car, is going to be, should I go with one of those? So I'll link to that as a separate video. And the last thing we just jump in is I always cover menswear on this channel. I also cover like men's lifestyle stuff. So if you want to know more about the best menswear on the internet, please subscribe and give a thumbs up for great videos. And also, if you like this type of lifestyle and car stuff, then comment below and let me know. With the release of the X2, BMW now has the full line from X1 up to X6. The X7 is apparently coming very soon. But I always think of the odd numbers as being the base models and then the even numbers being the sportier, sleeker versions of that base. So the X1 is your base model. To me, they always looked like an Honda HRV. And then the X2 is the sleeker, sportier version of the X1 because they're actually on the same wheelbase and same goes for the X3, X4, X4. X5, X6, etc. I've seen this car classified as a sport activity vehicle, not a sport utility vehicle because it is so small. It doesn't have a high wheelbase so that you can go off road, but it's made to be this like urban sleek version of a BMW X series. The last comparison I'll make to the X1 is that they both share the same wheelbase and the exact same engine. A lot of this stuff is the design of the body and the interior that has changed from the two. To me, the X2 looks like a sleek Panther ready to pounce from the redesigned upgraded LED headlights to the new kidney grills and just a sleek low profile through the entire car. The base model of the X2 starts at 38.4 US and the version I'm looking at today is optioned out at 46.9. In addition to the galvanic gold metallic paint, which is a stunning color, black Dakota leather, the convenience package, 19 inch alloy Y spoke wheels, and then the CarPlay compatibility. This is basically the package that I would end up getting. I really like having the panoramic sunroof, the heated seats and steering wheel. The wheels to me, I don't really care that much, but having the keyless entry and some of the other things in the convenience package, I really like. You also have this BMW badge back here on on the rear panel, which is something new to any of the models that I've seen in BMW, but I like it. I think it's striking and it really shows, hey, you're driving a BMW. This is not the M Sport Series. The M Sport Series doesn't upgrade the engine. It just really upgrades a lot of the aesthetics. The interior is a little bit different, a little bit nicer, but even the base model has these twin exhausts, which do give it a really sporty, mean kind of look. This is the X-Drive platform, so it's all wheel drive. And the way they've redesigned the hatchback on here is this becomes your handle to pop open the trunk. You don't have a ton of room in the back. I'd say you'd be able to get like two carry-ons and some backpacks back here, maybe a full-size luggage and a carry-on, but you do have the ability to drop those seats down and lay flat, so you could get a good bit of stuff in here if you needed to at a pinch. It is easy to drop the seats, so you got a button to press on the headrest to drop those, and then you're pretty easy to pull the tab, and flat you go. And because the car is so short, I don't think many people are gonna have trouble hitting this button to drop the hatchback. My car doesn't have a power hatch, so I don't know how new this design is to BMWs, but this button drops the door, this one drops it and locks it in one easy smooth button. You also have these LED L headlights, which are now a signature of the BMW brand, which are very similar in my i3 also. I don't know anybody that buys a car of this size expecting to have a lot of seating room in the back, but it does have a respectable amount. I've got enough headroom. I'm 6'4". I have enough headroom in here, and there's these designs of the seats which allow me to put my knees inside of here. This is the standard driving position that I would expect most people to be in as I was sitting in it before. And so I've got enough room, but it's not going to be great for road trips. The key is pretty simple. BMW, you got your unlock, you got your lock, hold this button to open up the hatch. You can open the hatch, but you cannot close the hatch with the remote button. Good to know. With the keyless entry as well, I like that you can lock the handle by touching here. I do that all the time on my car. And then as you walk up and you grab the handle, it unlocks for a nice smooth way. It's that fit and finish. I'm all about it. And you can see now it's getting darker. This is my i3. It has a nice illuminated panel, but it also projects to the ground a little bit. 
And you can see the same thing with the X2. It illuminates on the interior of the handle, but then it also projects slightly down to the floor. So just a really nice, pleasing aesthetic to the car that I like as well. You have a nice size glove compartment. Why does it call it a glove compartment? No one wears gloves anymore. This might be an option in the convenience package. It's definitely something I've missed in my i3 is having the option to set between driver one and two and then full power seating as well and then a lumbar support. This might be specific to the seat package that I have but there's this handle here where you can actually pop this out and have a longer leg rest. So good for me, it's not so nice and tall. And like this, a really nice, smooth, solid action to the handle inside as well. And then your standard window and mirror controls right here on the driver's side. And then you can pop right there. This is really your driver POV as you look down from the headrests. Uh, plenty of visibility as you look out of the car here. Steering wheel has the exact same button layout as my i3. You've got volume and phone controls over here. Then you have cruise control. Now, you do not have the option to get the active cruise control like I have in my i3, which I really, really like. That would almost be a deal breaker for me. I love having the active cruise control. Then you have turn signal over on the left and your windshield wiper over on the side. The instrument panel is extremely familiar, especially compared to others in the X line. I Just like in my I series, you have the same like navigation right here, but then there's also a touch screen up top with nice sizable text and you can also use navigation on there as well. You got conveniently placed cup holders there. You got your center panel that lifts. Then you've got storage on the inside as well. Something else I like about my i3 is it has this motion where you can lock it into a certain height depending on your preference. I'm very picky about where mine sits and so it's usually right about there. You see it is little things that I appreciate. You can see when you do the windshield wipers you've got three dispensers but there's also not a single seam as you look at the windshield after the windshield wipers go. It is just smooth all across. I really like this center infotainment navigation right here, up and down and rotating. It's kind of become second nature to me. You've got the menu, media, map and nav, and then your settings back here. It's really easy to look at the screen and navigate this very intuitive. And then you've got your stick shift here. This would be new to me because I'm used to driving my electric car. I am surprised to see a CD player in here. I've been in a number of new nice cars that they just don't put them in there anymore. Uh, my i3 doesn't have one. I have not missed it at all, but I guess it's nice that it's an option. Panoramic roof makes the whole cabin feel pretty sizable. They have nice, simple, easy controls here like you'd be used to in another BMW model. In this package, I have the backup camera, and it's one of the better backup cameras that I've come across. It has a really nice fisheye for a good range of view. But then you also have the radar on the side. The i3 that I have just has radar. I kind of wish that I had the backup camera as well. And then you can hear the sensors beeping because I'm coming up close on something here. The connected drive system to me has felt very intuitive from the beginning. It's really easy to navigate between the different options using that control that I showed you. but from the CarPlay standpoint, it is available, but what I found through the connective drive is if you just use Bluetooth, the Bluetooth tends to work so well, not just from a pairing standpoint and showing you what you're listening to, it even shows you album artwork, you can jump either between title or I listen to a lot of podcasts so I can skip 30 seconds back or forward. You do have the option in here to go with CarPlay, but what I have found over the last two years is that the connected drive system just with Bluetooth is I think even better than CarPlay. From what I've experienced with CarPlay, you can't use anything but Apple Maps, and I use Waze every day. And if you switch between Apple Maps and then you go to your podcast player, Overcast for me is supported, but then the phone jumps between the two and it, it ends up being much less intuitive than I would like. I think for a lot of people that might already just use the built-in apps, that might be fine. But just know that if you have an iPhone and you don't use the standard apps, or if you have an Android phone, the Bluetooth connection where it actually shares the album artwork Work, you can navigate into the parts of your device that have media in there so you can search artists and different things I think is extremely intuitive and I actually prefer it to the regular CarPlay at this point and then like I showed with the hot buttons before it's really easy to jump between what you're currently listening to you can jump to the navigation if you have something up or standard maps you can also jump to the phone if you want to make some phone calls and back to the what you're listening to just through those hot buttons also this is a great podcast 
This is another feature I like. My wife and I switched between keys and you can tell the car which key is which. So you can have a different profile for seating, entertainment, and other things within the vehicle depending on who is driving the car. There's a keyless push to start and then you have the option to turn off the automatic engine cutting when you're at a red light and that type of thing. All of the hallmarks of a BMW are right here in the interior. You've got the fit and finish that keeps me coming back to the brand. I love the way that this car sits, but let's go for a drive. You have this convenient LED in the center, which you can use the controls on the steering wheel in order to switch and control things without having to use the center button as well. The biggest difference between the two is definitely the handling. Because the whole car is slightly shorter, you sit lower to the ground, it has a much sportier feel to it. It feels a lot more like a Mini Cooper than the X1 does. Even at 6.4, I've got plenty of headroom in here, and then you can see the panoramic sunroof, which makes the whole car feel just a little bit bigger. The engine does have an auto stop feature, which seems like most modern cars do today. So if you stop at a stop sign, it's no problem. If you stop at a red light, you'll feel the engine kick off. And then as soon as you take your foot off of the brake, it kicks back on and you're good to go. I did see one review mention the road noise on this. I'm used to my i3. This doesn't seem any better or worse than my i3. I think my i3 is pretty quiet on the inside, so I don't have anything to note on that. This model does have the run flat tires, so between the sporty suspension, the really nice handling on here, and the low seating position, it reminds me of all the best parts about driving a Mini Cooper. If you're used to the interior of a BMW, all of this is going to feel very familiar. The climate controls are virtually all the same. I have the same center controlling spinning wheel on my i3, which feels very familiar as well. So everything on the inside feels very similar, but it is that classic BMW fit and finish that always has me coming back to the brand. I don't know if it's just me, but I've never really found an American car, even like some of the Lincolns, some of the Cadillacs kind of do it, but I've never really found the fit and finish of American cars to be as good as BMWs across the board, even this at a, a near baseline model. This isn't a seven series or anything like that. I like to be able to choose between sport, comfort, and Eco Pro, if you want better gas mileage or if you really want to feel the punch. Of course, this is an X1 engine, so you're not gonna feel so much punch, but it's nice to have that option. I love the sleek look of the car. I love the way that it drives. It has tight handling and it's extremely fun to drive. I really, at this point, wouldn't re even consider the X1 after driving both of them today. If you're walking into a BMW dealership, you already know you're looking at 35 to 40K for a car. This one at the base model at 38 being no different, optioned out, you're probably looking at 46 to 48, especially for the things that I want in the car. You gotta be ready to go for that, which at this point I am, and I'm ready to pay for what I like, and I'm ready to pay for the fit and finish that I expect in a vehicle. This is my first stop at my journey of looking at cars. I've been driving my i3 for two years. I haven't really looked. In this vehicle class, you basically got like the GLA, you've got the Range Rover Evoque, and you've got what the Volvo XC90, I think that might be the one, or it might be the smaller one from the XC90. And so this also raises the question is, should I look at Mini Coopers again? Because I love the way that this drive similar to a Mini Cooper, whereas the Mini Cooper, I've, I've just got a thing for Mini Coopers. I've always really loved them. Uh, I drove one for a little bit back when my wife had one, and so those could be the next ones on this road. I wanna hear any questions and comments from you guys. Did I cover enough stuff in the video? Should I go drive the other cars and, and compare them in a similar way? Uh, definitely stay tuned for that X1 versus X2 video because uh, that was really fun to put together, and I think I got all the stuff covered in that that I wanted. I know I'm no Doug DeMuro, but I've always wanted to make videos that I would be wanting to see or watch and I basically covered all the stuff that I wanted to see in this video so love to hear your guys feedback on any of that stuff until next time gents this is the Cavalier